Thank you, Ingrid. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. It's really, really a pleasure to see all of you here. Especially, my special thanks go to the students because I know you've had a tough, busy day and you've worked a lot. So I really appreciate that you can be here. As the title says, what I would like to do tonight is to talk to you a little bit about Brazil and the Millennium Development Goals, but not about Brazil or the Millennium Development Goals separately. And yet, how we decided to go about them. What were the strategies? What was our project? How was the project design, planning, implementation, and monitoring when it comes to the Millennium Development Goals? Before that, I would like to tell you two little things. One thing is about Brazil. I think it's important to know a little bit of the background of what I'm going to talk about. And what I would think it's important for you to know right now is we are a big country. We're a very, very big country. We're the fifth largest country in the world, both in terms of size and population. And that is a blessing, but it's also a lot of trouble. What else you need to know? We speak Portuguese, we are a presidential republic currently under President Dilma Rousseff, who was the first female president we've had, and we are the sixth largest economy in the world. We just recently overtook the UK, but yet most British people have much better living standards than the Brazilians that I know. And that can be explained by just one word social inequality. When you look at the GDP in per capita terms, we are only the 53rd in the world, meaning that there's a lot of people who have a lot of money and a lot of people who don't have enough, who don't have what they should have. And the Millennium Development Goals, in the case of Brazil, were specifically to bridge this gap. What can we do so that we raise all of those people up? Because the money is here, the Personal capacities are here, but they're just not coming together. If you can look at that photo, it's not photoshopped, it's not put together. This is really how it is. This is the neighborhood of Morumbi in Sao Paulo, and that's the Paraisópolis favela. It's their view from their window. And how do you explain to those people that they cannot have the things that the other ones just across their window have? The favela of Paraisópolis has actually a very good story to tell. They are a pacified favela. Currently, they are in a much better situation nowadays than the situation that they were at when this picture was taken. And most of this work was done through the Millennium Development Goals and the projects that were implemented. And this is what I would like to tell you a little bit about. The Millennium Development Goals, I'll just give a very, very brief overview of it. And I know it's very small and you're not supposed to read. It's just for you to have an idea of how many things we are talking about when we talk about the Millennium Development Goals. They were set by the UN and approved at the General Assembly in 2000 through the Millennium Declaration. And it basically brought in some standards, eight goals of standard rights and needs that every human being should be able to enjoy everywhere in the world. And whereas this would, was very interesting for some countries, others said we are in a very comfortable position, in Switzerland are in a very comfortable position, what is in there for me? And that's why Ban Ki-moon and Kofi Annan, who was the Secretary General at the time, also insisted in including a clause saying, look, you will only reach truly what the Millennium Declaration is talking about if you also cooperate. If you don't want to cooperate with these countries because you're not concerned about, let's say, humanity as a whole, if you're not thinking about Ubuntu, as we say, think what can happen to your country or to the world if we fail. If we fail, we are talking about risks of excessive migration, we are talking about epidemic diseases, we are talking about environmental degradation. So that's what's in it for you. Even if your country is rich and is in a comfortable position, jump in, bring your expertise, bring your capacity, because we need you to be able to reach these goals. And these goals range from um, ending extreme poverty in the world to improving maternal health to 
uh, improving the condition or stopping the contamination of HIV, from empowering women, keeping girls in schools. It's really eight goals and I don't need to go about them now because what I really want to tell you is how we decided to go about this. What were the strategies? And I'm really talking about project planning here in hopes that some of these project ideas and some of these principles that we adopted can be useful in other realities. I know that every country has their particularities and I'm not telling here, that's not my goal to say copy what we did and bring it to other places because it's going to work like it worked for us because it won't. But there are principles that perhaps can be applied to other realities and this is what I would like to discuss. So, when the Millennium Declaration was approved and when Brazil said, we are in, what do we have to do? It was the UNDP, the United Nations Development Program Office, that jumped in. And the first partners, as always, when you come into a project like that in a country, has to be the federal government. So the UNDP partnered with the federal government and with the states. Brazil has 26 states and one federal district. I'll tell briefly about that to design a plan of how to go about these goals. We are talking about eight major goals and several other goals that have their particularities. So what was done in this case? UNDP had needs and goals. They needed, when drafting the campaign, first to figure out what do we need to do? Who do we need to come together? And this is the first thing, whenever you're drafting a campaign, that you need to know. What do I need? And also, what are your goals? What do I want with them? So the first thing was to shape these things. So they knew, because Brazil had this very peculiar organization with the 26 states, one federal district being so big, that a project to work needs to bring everyone together. And as in many, many countries, we have very strong leaders, regional leaders, who have different interests, who have different political parties, and how do you convince those people, how do you sell that idea to them that they need to come together? One thing happened. That was this. Does anyone know who this guy is? That was our president and he took office, our former president, he took office in 2003. And UNDP saw that as the chance to get this campaign going. Why? Because the feeling in the country at the time was very similar if you followed the Obama, the first campaign uh, of hope, of change, of transformation, that this is the moment. If we've never done anything up to now, this is when we can get things going. So everybody in the country was feeling very motivated. This guy only had the primary school. He didn't have, um, uh, he didn't go to university. He didn't have the chance to go to university. And the working class of the country, which is huge, finally could recognize themselves in the leader in front of them and believe in that. So when he was elected, UNDP saw, this is our moment. We need to use this political momentum to get people involved and engaged. But they also knew that just having him was not going to be enough. You need to involve people on the ground from all layers of society so that a project can work. So they came up with a plan. And that's what I want to tell you also. Oh, coming back. They knew that whenever you want to sell a project, you don't just come up with this project and get it going. You need to talk to people first. You need to raise awareness on what are the issues that we want to discuss. The problem with many projects is that you have a project that was very successful in one area, and then you say, look, this worked here. Why wouldn't it work in another place? So we come with this ready-made project. You bring it up to a different country, different reality, different needs, and try to push it down people's throat, like we say it, and you expect people to buy it just because you know better. And in Brazil, there is something very interesting also. We don't see the United Nations as something close to us. People are very unaware of the role of the UN. The UN, for most Brazilians, is that distant organization 
that does some work for people who are hungry somewhere in the world or where there was a flood, they come. But there is really this lack of awareness of what are the other agencies of the UN and what is it that they do. So for the UN and UNDP specifically, to come into the country and say, look, this is a United Nations project and we would like to implement it here and we would like to bring it to you, people are not going to buy. So this was something else that's very interesting and important whenever we are designing a project. You need to know what is the reality on the ground, how do people feel about things, and how can you use that on your favor. They knew that everybody was excited about Lula, and if they were going to buy any project that was being presented, be it the, the Millennium Development Goals, even to improve the situation in the country, they needed to, I don't know, Brazilianize the Millennium Development Goals, if I can use this term. They needed to make it in a way where people would recognize the things that they are seeing. And before even starting to act, we needed to educate and raise awareness. So the campaign, or the project, was broken down in two parts. One part, we're going to just tell people about it. We're going to talk about it. We're not going to do anything else. We're going to go to everywhere where we can think of. We're going to use all the partners we can gather. And we're still talking only about UNDP, the federal government, and the state governments. And we're going to spread the word about it. Once everybody knows about this, we can start acting. Because then people will buy it. And then I like to compare it to a little bit of the Brazilian culture. Brazilians love soap operas. We just love it. Everybody stops whatever they are doing to watch it. And it's that thing. The chapter ended, myself included, so the chapter ended today. You need to know what is going to happen tomorrow. So you watch it one day. Don't tell me a story if you're not going to tell me how it's going to end. And this is basically what they did. They said, we're going to tell you a story. We're going to talk to you about these goals or what is it that we're going to do. And there is more. There is competition. We are measuring all of these other countries. So people are like, yeah, so are we winning? You have to tell me how this is going to end. What can I do so that I contribute to this? And people really bought into that. And I'm going to show just a little something here. On this awareness raising. So, like I was telling you, we were just telling this story. We were just talking to people about what is it that we want to do, what are these goals, what are these things. And there was a very important deadline. From when they started the campaign, which was after Lula took office, if I'm um, April 2003, they started to get going to draft the campaign. In October 2004, we were going to have municipal elections. So they knew, this is the time we have to spread the word. Because in 2004, October, there will be municipal elections. And you know what? We found out that politicians will promise anything if that will get them votes. So we need them to include the Millennium Development Goals. Any of them, choose one of the eight. Whatever you choose, we are already happy with. And if people are demanding that, if people say, look, I'm listening, I'm, I'm starting to hear this story about improving my quality of life. I'm starting to hear this story about the fact that we can be better. Elections are coming. Are you concerned about that too? They knew that if the momentum <laughs> passed, after October, you could not get these politicians to commit to anything. They had to commit before that. So let's get ready. Let's get this campaign in one year and more, a little bit more going before we can act. So what we did was that UNDP knew also that it was not enough to have just the federal governments and the federal <coughs> government and the state governments. It needed more partners. Look at the size of the country. It's huge. It doesn't matter how willing and committed these partners are. We just need more people. So it decided to recruit. Who can help us? Who is interested in helping us with this task? of promoting the Millennium Development Goals. Again, really just spreading the word. And a committee was formed with four companies, not companies, or four organizations, UNDP being one of them, the United Nations Development Program, and three other organizations that were very recognizable for Brazilians. 
And this is something very important, and we discuss it in class when we talk about projects. If you're partnering, beware. Because whoever you put into your project will have a face, people might associate you with that. So you need partners that are reliable and that people can trust. Because even if they're not doing anything that harmful, which is the case, and I'm sorry, there was a project that happened in Bolivia, and Nestle wanted to act up as a partner. And there are serious problems also with Nestle in Bolivia of trying to privatize water. So why would people even want to buy into that, knowing that you have this partner who has also all of those vested interests behind it? Anyway, we needed the partners who were easily to recognize that everybody trusted and that already had their own network. So these partners were COAP, which is this committee of entities against hunger and for life, which is basically 700 or more civil society organizations that came together and formed this committee. 700 civil society organizations is a lot of people who already have their connections, who already have their reputation, who already have their access to people on the ground, and this was key. One of the other partners was ETHOS, which is a very respected uh, entity in Brazil for business and ethics and, and corporate social responsibility, if we can talk about it. And McCann Erickson, which is an American advertisement agency. I'll tell you why. At the time, um, they are responsible for that campaign from MasterCard. There are things in life that money cannot buy for everything else there is MasterCard. <coughs> So this was very big in Brazil at the time, people loved this campaign and they were the advertisement campaign that chose to volunteer to get this spreading the word, let's call it, project going. So what did they do? They started to tell people about the campaign. I'll tell you what it says. It says eight ways to change the world, we can. And here on the bottom, you find the logos for every one of the goals. Not for a single minute you will read Millennium Development Goals in there. Because if I would go to my aunt or my old grandmother to say, Grandma, let's talk about the Millennium Development Goals. What are you telling me? Like, I don't know what this is. And I know that for advertisement, it might sound crazy never to put the name of the product that you're trying to advertise in there, but that was needed because putting Millennium Development Goals, UN, would simply just put people away. When you read that, when you look at it, eight ways to change the world, what is the first thing that comes to mind? Yeah, what? What, what are these eight ways to change the world? We can, like I can. So it was just to sparkle people's interest. Whenever you would see that, you would want to know what are these eight ways to change the world. And for everyone, like I said, every one of the logos, uh, sorry, every one of the goals, you can see the logos in there. And this was so successful that it was soon translated into other languages. It was translated <coughs> to English, it was translated to Spanish. It is officially adopted by more than 30 countries who are also working with the Millennium Development Goals. And it's um, free, it's no, for no cost. There is no patent rights on it. It was something that McCann and the committee decided to let everyone adopt and adapt to their realities also. Uh, one thing about that, it needed to be simple, it needed to be easily recognizable so that young people, old people, illiterate people, 10% of the Brazilian population is illiterate, could see, could recognize. But at the same time, it needed to be professional enough so that the intellectuals and the elites would not reject it. Ah, this looks childish. Why, why would I even want to participate in something like that? So again, this is something when we're talking about project and project design and planning. All of these things were already in mind. All of these things were thought and designed so that people would feel like jumping in and participating in this project. And then they started with the actions to promote. And I can tell just some of these actions. Um, one of the, that first logo you see on top, Pão de Açúcar, is a very famous supermarket chain, the, the green things. Um, and they are present in 
many, many cities in different regions of the country. So what they did was that in all of their shopping bags, also again for free, it would be of no cost for them, they decided to print the Millennium Development Goals with that logo, always just to keep the corporate identity, to have it easily recognizable for people. Pão de Açúcar said, leave it with us, we'll print that on bags. Everyone shops. <coughs> Poor, rich, they are present in different areas, different um, uh, economic power areas, so people would shop, get their shopping bag and look at it. And it was so interesting, because at the time, it was not a niche to have advertisement in shopping bags. But after they did that, they said, oh, this actually works. We can start a business with that. And then it went from there for other objectives with other goals. Um, there are supermarkets that now also because of the environmentability, uh, environmental conscious, we don't give away the plastic bags anymore. You can buy either a paper bag or you can buy a plastic bag that is more resistant and the money goes to one of these institutions. So all of these things started to be developed as part of the plan to spread and tell people about the Millennium Development Goals. Banco do Brasil, which is the Brazilian bank, it's present in every single city, all the 5,532 cities in the country, maybe it's more of as we speak, but last time I checked that was the number. They decided to put on their ATMs, and ATM is not something that only rich people have access because the state allowances and the funds that you get from the state, you receive a card, you have to go there and, and get it. So either you are rich or poor, you will have access to an ATM or to a bank agency. All of the ATMs were displaying, so the first screen and the first thing that you see, eight ways to change the world, yes. We, so we were really bombarding the people with information during this period of one year to get them interested in it. Something that I thought was very funny, Portela, which is one of the samba schools in Rio de Janeiro, decided to dedicate, I think in 2005, one of the parades. So I'll tell briefly about Carnival. In Rio de Janeiro specifically, every samba school needs to choose a theme. So the whole parade is based on that theme, be it Egypt. So all the cars and all the songs, the music that is playing, all the costumes have to be related to Egypt. And Portela decided that they want to do it with the Millennium Development Goals. So it was really funny because that song plays for 90 minutes. Every school has 90 minutes for the parade. The whole country stops to watch that. People like to see it. They talk on TV. It's on magazines. They did it. The theme is free. You choose the theme. So they were not paying or receiving anything for, for that. And after 90 minutes with the same song playing, you would see a little child talking about, eh, we can fight hunger, and the Millennium Development Goals, and you're like, okay. So it's, it's getting on people's minds, these things. And it was just trying to reach out to different audiences. Again, trying to relate it to project. If you have a plan and you think that that will stick to everybody, it's not going to work. Everyone has different needs. Every single part, and especially in such a big country where the realities are so different, you need to be able to know how to adapt to these realities. One of the other things that was done was this campaign <coughs> for the website. It's the website, again, not called Millennium Development Goals, but we can, we can enlarge it. It's just a website that people could access and find out more about what are these goals, where can I find events. If I'm in my community here in the state of Sergipe, where I'm from, which is the smallest state in the country, you could go there and see all of the events that were taking place in your state, how you could collaborate, what could you do. And all of those companies and the, the, the organizations that were part of the committee were just contributing towards that paying for the server, for the provider, giving it pro bono. And all of this campaign in a year, if we had had to pay, would have cost $30 million. We didn't pay a cent. Everything was done pro bono. Because the United Nations Development Program said, okay, look, we even have this money, but we would prefer to invest it in a real project, on the ground. So what can you have to, what do you have to offer? 
And so many people had so many things to offer because they were still in the mood of that wave of change that Lula was, was spreading. Okay. So I talked about some more general um, tools or some more general campaigns that were done, actions. And here, after that first phase, they started to enter the second phase of the project that was more tailored campaigns. We know already a little bit more about our people. What specificities do they have? How do we know what is the best thing that they have to offer? How do we get their attention on what is the best things that they have? And there were two main audiences, let's call, because the, that year was almost over. You needed the actions, you needed real projects to go and start putting in place. So, okay, we need to reach to decision makers. Now it's the time that we get politicians, that we get mayors, that we get governors, that we get secretaries to sign things, to authorize projects. That now we need big NGOs with their whole network to come and participate with us. So UNDP now broke down their campaign to different publics and audiences. Again, when we're talking about project, different people and different branches of your audience have different needs. And it's very important to be attentive to these needs. So if you're talking about a youth project, they would usually advertise it either in schools or put it on MTV, make a band, do a concert and promote it, make it look cool. If we're talking about decision makers, ethos, that um, uh, ethics and social cor corporate social responsibility organization would give trainings for managers. You are interested in knowing more about this, you're interested in doing something, we'll have a training, a training session specifically guided towards the Millennium Development Goals. Come and we'll give you exactly what you need. For women, there were projects, especially those related to the environment, on catalogs for beauty products. It's like Avon. The, the American company that you have that book, but it's a Brazilian company, Natura, it's also very big. So all of their catalogs had something in it. Um, school booklets, everything that you could think of. Business schools decided to include that in their exams. Um, for college entrance examinations, all of the themes were starting to be demanded from the universities. In Brazil, you have access to university through an entrance, a college entrance exam. And there is usually maths, physics, chemistry, and everything else, and an open theme for an article that you have to write. And you don't know it in advance, but you hear things. Look, these are the themes of the year. So if it's the year of the World Cup, let's say we're talking about promotion of tourism, or this or that, or how can we improve the infrastructure. On that year it was, look, this is the thing right now. It's the Millennium Development Goal. So it would force people to get informed and to read about that. And then, like I said, because we love a soap opera, don't tell us a story if you're not going to tell us how it's going to end. It got people going. But then there is always the problem. Whenever there is this wave of participation, people come and they jump in and they collaborate and they give in what they have. But how do you make that sustainable? How do you make sure for, this, for these projects that these are not going to be several one-way, one-time only participations? You needed to keep them motivated enough so that they would keep coming in and contributing and doing new things. So in 2005, the then President Lula decided to create this week, the Annual National Citizenship and Solidarity Week, where all the states had to participate Organizations and companies were invited and they had to come in, awards were given and tell the stories of what were the things that they were doing. And companies who had good results or especially with the UN Global Compact, for those of you who know what the UN Global Compact does, um, companies that are already registered there, basically they, the UN has this business branch in a way that tries to promote sustainability within corporations. And if you are registered to UN Global Compact, chances are that you have a good record, you're a company people can rely on. 
So, okay, these people are already interested in sustainability. Let's call them in. Let's have them participate in this week. And they would just encourage. Good results can bring tax cuts, and this is something a lot of people like. Or if it's your city that has a good prize, we'll try to promote your city more, we'll praise your city. So every year, because this was going to happen, you don't want to be the city that looks bad on, on this event. You knew that you had to keep doing something because this annual week is going to come and I need to show what are the projects that I'm doing that will meet one of those eight goals. And that also kept people going. One other thing, we have this federal accounting office, which is basically the institution in Brazil that uh, authorizes the spending. It checks the spending of the states, every single state, makes sure that it's good and also authorizes the spending. Because you're, of course, a state cannot spend more than what it has. So it checks your bills and sees that this law is okay to go, that law is not okay to go. What the Federal Accounting Office did was that projects and laws that were related to the Millennium Development Goals will have priority. So if you want a law to be approved, it ha faster, it should be somehow related to this. Of course, that you can tell me, okay, so people would just draw and design whatever project so that it's approved. Okay, it could be the case. But that was also the case where so many other good projects came in and had the opportunity to function and to work. And it also, again, kept people motivated enough not to just jump in once and I did my duty, I'm going to heaven. And yet, no, it's harder than that. You need to work a little bit more. Once all of that was done, and you spread the news, and you told everybody, now we can act. And this is when the project entered, the campaign entered the second phase, phase of action. And I cannot tell you about all the actions that were done, because again, we're talking about eight goals that have sub-goals, that have other things. But just to give an example, because it's probably one of the most known projects related to the Millennium Development Goals, it's called the Bolsa Familia. It's a family allowance that is given to families who have very little income. And it ranges depending on the region where this family lives, uh, depending on the amount of children that exist in this family. It ranges from 10 to 90 euro a month. So there are families that get 10 euro a month. And you have no idea of how that transformed the country. There are many people who are for very vocal critics, critics of it because you say it generates it's existentialism and you're generating dependence. Really, you say that this generated dependence if you've never seen hunger. And you don't know how 10 euros can change someone's life if they know that that is coming. There are, of course, other sides to it. We need how you're not just giving this money away to people. If you have kids, you have to show me that your kids are in school at least 85% of the time. If they miss more than 15% of the classes, once you get a warning, twice your benefit is cut and you go to the end of the line. So it was just amazing to see the mothers demanding of for their children. Look, have good results, look, stay in school, look. And the number, how this also helped drop the, the ch child labor. Because if you're working to help it at home, you cannot go to school. But if you don't go to school, this benefit is not going to come to you. So it affected not only the first goal that was to reduce poverty, but so many of the others. Education improved and access, um, um, access to jobs, so many other things improved as a result of this, that was just one of the actions. For us, it costs 0.5% of our gross internal product, uh, the gross domestic product. And it lifted 40 million people out of poverty. It's one Argentina of people. But why? Because if you are registered in this program, you have access to training programs in your area. They're not going just to give you this money and hope that you can stay with this money forever. There are training programs for professions, be it civil construction, um, uh, sewing, 
or hotel cleaning or all of this that since you're registered in this program it's free it's in your neighborhood you come and you attend in hopes that that will give you conditions so that you can come out and people are very proud to give back their cards to say look I don't need this anymore I now have a job I now have a profession that will make me go even further here's the card register somewhere else so this was just one of the actions but every action if you don't want to lose track of it, needs monitoring. And this was also very important for not only for this project, but for any project that we have. How do we know that a project is working? We have to look for it, we have to watch, we have to make sure we know exactly what is going on. So once the second phase of the campaign, being the action part, started working, monitoring systems were implemented throughout the whole country, by the UNDP, by the World Bank, who had all of the data, and by two Brazilian statistics organizations, who knew the country better than the World Bank and who knew exactly where things were. So what did they want? They wanted that every single municipality, so it was at the municipal level, gave them their data. What do you have? What is the situation related to every one of those goals? So if it's, let's say, in here we have uh, an example, which is child mortality up to five years old. Um, we need to know how many children up to five years old in your city are dying. We need to know that in your city, we need to know that in your city, in all the cities throughout the country. Why? Because sometimes when we look at national numbers, they fool us. They fool us really, really a lot. It might look really great in general, but you don't know. You lose track of where is it on the ground that the things are not working. So if we look at it just quickly, I can try to make it larger. Yeah. For child mortality in 1996, by region, we have the northeastern part of the country, which is where Sao Paulo is located, Rio de Janeiro is located, it's the uh, industrially developed part of the country. Oh, sorry, sorry, the northeastern part of the country, the agricultural part of the country, which is where I'm from. Historically, it always suffered a lot with drought. So, because in the 40s and in the 50s it was not industrial, it was mainly agricultural, every time that there was a drought, there was no action plan, and people would suffer and they would have to go somewhere. And the south of the country is considered a developed, very best developed part of the country. Um, they have good numbers always for everything. It's always seen as the example. Don't ask me why. That's just how things work. When you look at the numbers in 1996, they were very different. In the northeastern region, 89 out of every thousand children were suffering from child mortality up to five years old. In the south, it was just 29 out of a hundred. Uh, sorry, out of a thousand. If you looked only at the general number, you wouldn't know exactly where these problems are located. So the monitoring system needed it to be municipally measured so that we know where can we improve. What is not working and where can we go so that it works. So once they saw those things, they knew, okay, really, this problem is mostly located in the northeastern part of the country. Look at the drop. Ten years later, when it was measured again, the drop in the northeastern was huge because the actions were focused really there. This monitoring was done mainly by five Brazilian universities, five leading universities in the country, University of Brasilia, University of Sao Paulo, universities that were spread and located in different regions, just gave their students their computers and said, look, we're monitoring, they are students, they have fresher mind, work. What is it that you suggest? And how is it that we can get these numbers that we are receiving and transform it into action? So you had, at the same time, work being done for people, training and research being done by the students, and everybody thinking about it. And it's free. You're at university. You're not getting money for doing research. You're actually very glad and happy if you can get a professor who is willing to do research with you. So they are very motivated to do that also. And that's what 
again, to try to put it in the bigger picture, whenever we have a project, it's extremely important to have in place a monitoring system for it. That's the only way we know how it will work. How do we look now? 2015 is the deadline for the Millennium Development Goals. We've met in advance two of them in 2010, which was the number one to uh, eradicate extreme poverty and misery in the country, and the number six, which is to stop the contamination of HIV and start reversing the trend. All of the others are on track. All of the others are to be met in time. There was a problem the United Nations said last year that we were not going to meet the Millennium Development Goal for improving maternal health. Not because women were dying, but because of malnutrition or anything, but because now they were getting more obese than what they should. And because of this monitoring system, the UN said it's not going to be met. Last year we had the biggest reduction of all times. They knew where the problems were located. The monitoring systems were in place. So I said, okay, you're thinking we want, we know where the mistakes are, let's work on them. If you had just an average, or if you had just a, a national number, it would be really hard to pinpoint where the problems are located. What sort of problems do these women have? Are we talking about not access to those neonatal exams? Or are we talking about malnutrition? Or are we talking about lack of hospitals in this area? Actually, you were talking about obesity. So it was possible to identify. What can we learn from it? Some of the lessons, there are many, and lessons are what you get out of a story, is what will be the final lesson for you. But some of the things, political events can be great opportunities for a project. Be aware of what is happening in a country. Be aware of how you can transform it into something that you can work with. But at the same time, they won't be sufficient. Presidential leadership, or whatever leadership we're talking about, is very important, but it's not going to be enough. You need people to jump in. You need to involve whole society. Just more, early engagement of partners. From the beginning, they came together. They knew what they wanted. It was very clear what were the needs, what were the goals. We need to lift this country up. We need to build those bridges that we didn't have in place before. And that was also very important. And then something with the budget. The limited funds won't stop us, and it shouldn't. We always talk about being creative here. And if you have a project, you know that the first difficulty that you're going to encounter is the budget. What do I do with it? In that case, we had partners who were very knowledgeable in their areas who decided to donate some of their time and skills and they didn't stop the campaign from being the success that it was. You, have, you need to have a clear overarching message. You needed the logos that people could recognize, but things just made sense. Some of the logos that you see, they look different but alike. You know, even if it's not written, you recognize what you're talking about. And that's very important for people to also engage and participate in that, for, for the message to be clear to people. If you want people to participate, they need to know what they're participating on. Have a professional approach. Even though we needed to have it widespread for illiterate people, for old people, for elites, it needed to look professional for everyone. Because I'm not going to give my funds or my money or my time to something that looks messy or undone. So even if you don't have the enough funds for putting your project going, have it look professional. And people might then believe in what you're trying to sell. Use the country's cultural traditions, social habits. We used the Samba schools. We used the beauty magazines. We used the kids who used to watch MTV. We used the shopping bags that everyone had. We used the little ATMs. Things were printed in people's um, water bills, the bills that would come to your house to pay the water. You have eight ways to change the world, yes, we can. Know where you are, because it will change depending on where you go. And if you step up with the wrong approach, it can be the end of your campaign. There is a famous story of an NGO 
Anyway, we don't need to name, name names, but after the war in Kosovo, the, the whole infrastructure of the country was, was shattered, was destroyed, including schools. So this NGO said, you know what we can do? We can have mobile schools. We get vans, we put lots of books, and we go from one village to the other, going after these children so that they don't lose time um, out of school. Yeah, you know, you got the vans, you got the books. The problem was that the whole road infrastructure of the country was destroyed. And the roads that you could use, some had mines. How much thought did you put into that? So you have this van, and, and fuel for the vans was very hard to get fuel in the country at the time. So it's a great idea, it's a great project, but what did you know about the country? What did you use of the country before going in? And it was just a waste of time for everybody. Have distinct phases of education and advocacy. Because before you tell people to do something, they need to believe in what is it that they're going to do. I'm going to talk briefly about just a quick case study of one of the goals, so it's more clear to you. Um, but it was basically to tell people to use condoms. So before I can give you a condom, or before I can get you to go someplace and get a condom, I need to tell you about that and educate you about that. And then I lower the prices of it, you become more interested, and as the prices are lower, we can also increase the amount of condoms in the market. If I already come to you saying, look, use this, this is what you need, we're distributing things here, people won't necessarily know what it is about. Same project, there was a uh, same problem. There was a project somewhere in India. Um, they, they wanted to, to have people use toilets, the toilet structures, because to improve the sanitation and the health in the areas. So they came in and put these things there, and it was just not part of people's traditions at the time to use it like that. Had you explained, or had you listened from them, why is that they don't use? Or what is their need? Perhaps your money would have been better invested somehow, somewhere else, or with a different project in the same place and monitor your progress. That's the only way you will know what's working and what is not working. Otherwise, the money is being there, it's being spent, and you don't know what's good and bad. So just before we close for today, I would like to tell you a little bit about the Millennium Development Goal number 6A, which, we, which is to have halted by 2015 and begun to reverse the spread of HIV AIDS from ages 15 to 49. Why? Because this is what the United Nations decided, that it had to be from 15 to 49. In 1990, looking at the trend of contamination in Brazil, the World Bank said we are going to have, by the year 2000, 1.2 million people infected with AIDS in the country. That's what's going to happen. We are monitoring what's happening here, and we know that this is how Brazil will look like by year 2000. We're in 2012 and the number of infected people is 600,008. It's a huge success. It's 0.4% of our population. If you compare with countries where transmission rate is even of, um, um, where the contamination rate is even of 1% or 70% as we have, this is a huge success. Um, and then you can look at the success and also at the failures here. In a population up to 34 years old, in 96, the incidence at every 100,000 people was 70.5 people. In 2007, it was a 39.3, so it was a big drop. Uh, 35 to 39, not a, such a big drop, but a smaller drop. From 40 to 49, it actually increased. And from 60 plus, it increased almost 60%. I, I'm not good with math, but I think that's more or less 60 percent. Why? Because it was not part of the initial project. People were not <coughs> concerned about the population over 60. Come on, we're talking about AIDS. These people are not the target of our campaign. Yes, but life expectancy grew. People are doing much more. They have access to much more things. Blue pills are in the market. And that's what happened. You needed to adapt your campaign to it. And still, even with this increase, 
the program to fight AIDS by, that's developed by Brazil is considered by the UN, by the Economist also, the most successful program in developing countries and one of the most successful programs in the world. So what is it that we did? Focusing on all of those areas, ranging again from education. Education has to be always the first step for any project. You need to educate people about it. And then we're talking about prevention, then we're talking about treatment, then we're talking about reintegration. So I'll tell you a little bit of what was done, especially focusing on education and treatment that I will go to at the end. So there were two, two big projects. One focusing in schools, called Health and Prevention in Schools, Attitude to Enjoy Life, something like that. It was a federal program implemented in every public school in the country that was there to tell people about AIDS and to give condoms in schools to 12 and 13 year old. Funny enough, we are the country with the largest Catholic population in the world, but it was not a problem. Because one thing is abstinence as a personal choice, but as a government policy, Brazil knew that it could not preach for abstinence. We have to talk about safe sex instead. We're not going to pretend that these children are having sex at an early age, which they are, and just focus on the wrong things. You knew the Brazilian culture. And that's why this project, I don't know if it would be successful in the same way in other countries. Because for us, it was very easy to talk on TV about that. You would see soccer players um, being a hero or being a good player is to wear condoms. Or you would see supermodels doing fashion shows, be positive, have a good attitude. Did, did the churches come on board with that? They had to accept it. They didn't fight it. That mm -hmm. was, it, it did not become a problem, honestly. I think also because, and then we have to talk about Brazilian history with, of church and religion with Leonardo Boffi and with all of the people who are related to church who had a different approach, but they could not fight it. They said, okay, if we have to deal with that, we'll deal with that. Um, and another thing was this um, general called point of culture, something like that, which were basically neighborhood centers or community centers in different areas that you used both to promote to promote popular culture, but also to prevent HIV. You just had people there who could talk about it, and at the same time, let's distribute condoms, and let's share stories, and let's educate people on how is it that this works. And when I talk about inclusion, something really interesting. USAID had a grant of $50 million for Brazil as part of their budget to fight HIV. And then it came to Brazil and said, look, but for us to give you this money, you have to reject and condone prostitution. <laughs> As a campaign, you have to, we cannot partner with prostitutes because this is where the problem is. And we'll give you this money, but if you're not condoning prostitution, you're basically just helping to spread the problem. So thank you very much. Take your money back. We cannot do that. And why can't we do this? Because these people are actually our partners. They are in society. They are there. Whether it's the, prostitute, the, the prostitutes or the sex workers, or it's the transvestite communities, or it's the excluded communities, we need to get, call these people in instead. Educate them so that they can educate. I'm not going to tell a sex worker to stop being a sex worker. Even if I do, why would she listen to me? Why would he listen to me? Instead, let's use their lifestyle, have them keep it if that's what they want or if that's what the conditions make them do, but know how to protect themselves. And this worked, and it just shows, whenever we're talking about conflict resolution, don't exclude anyone, because these things will come back to get you. They will come back for you. And part of this, this campaign being the success that it was, was that no partners were excluded. It's very funny that the campaigning, it, it was so massive, I have a real story to tell. I have a friend, she's more or less my age, and she, had, she has a sister, and at the time her sister was five years old, I think. 
So my, my friend was studying in the living room of her house, reading, sitting at the table, and her sister, the five-year-old, was in her living room, in her bedroom, watching cartoons. The morning, 10 in the morning, watching cartoons. And suddenly she comes rushing into the living room, crying, in tears. And then my friend is like, what happened, Evan? Oh, you know, five-year-old, I think I have eight. <laughs> what? Like, what are you talking about? But you know, yes, I have eight. Tell me, what are you talking about? I just saw that on TV, this man say that if you don't use condoms, you're going to have AIDS. <laughs> and I never used the condoms. <laughs> okay, this is not what it means. This is not what they mean. But it's just to show that the campaigns were so widespread, it was in the commercial break of a children's show. <laughs> Eventually, I think we found the right tone with these campaigns. And I would like to show you two 30-second campaigns each, just so you can see. One is um, directed specifically for children, and the other is for a wider audience. They are both in Portuguese, subtitled in English. Entre estas crianças, existe uma que tem AIDS. Você saberia dizer qual é? Será a Maria? Será a Joana? Será o José? Pois é, na escola não existe espaço para o preconceito. Igual a você, tenho amigos, família. Tenho projetos, trabalho, planos. Tenho fé, crenças, esperança. Tenho amor, tristeza, alegria, opinião e lembranças. Tenho sonhos e desejos. Tenho responsabilidades e direitos. Igual a você, quero respeito. that are really about humanizing people. We're not demonizing this disease. We need people to see and to come to us to show that they need treatment and that they won't be excluded by society. And finally, because it's not enough just to educate people. These people are sick and they need treatment. And what about the people that are already infected? What is, I know Max is already very curious because he recognizes something in there. I'll talk about it in a while. Um, and the, this part is the treatment. What was that we did as a country to treat those people and how did it succeed? The Brazilian Constitution says that healthcare is a right of all and a duty of the state. Meaning, because you're a regular taxpayer, you, you get health care from the state. That doesn't make us socialists, it's just what our constitution states. Um, so, every single person who had AIDS had to come to health units in their neighborhoods and say, look, I have AIDS, give me the treatment. Up to 1996, the treatment was really just to control the side effects of all of the diseases that AIDS would provoke. After 96, when the antiretroviral drugs became more available, the civil society organizations, the same ones of the prostitutes and of the people who were contaminated and for gay rights or for spouses who were contaminated, all of these civil society organizations pressured the government to provide this medicine as soon as possible. And this just shows how important it is for civil society to be organized. Because we're talking here about governments, we're talking here about projects, but this was only possible because these groups were there making pressure from day one. In 83, when the first case was diagnosed and people became aware of what was going to happen, these groups were organized and pressured the government. And the government started to offer these drugs. You have the cocktail that you give the drugs, so you come to these community centers, these health centers in your neighborhood, 
you will get tested if that's what you want, and you will get the confirmation, let's say, that you are HIV positive. Starting from there, you have access to doctors, psychologists, and social workers in your area that will follow up with you every month. Every month you go there to these centers, you will get the medicine, they only give you the enough for one month because you need to go back to make sure you are complying, that you're taking the medication as you should take, and you are there. In then there was this big problem with the costs. The costs for a patient per year were an average of $10,000 per patient per year. We had 600,000 people. That we needed to pay that. Because even if you are rich, and even if you can afford, there are no antiretroviral drugs for purchase in a regular pharmacy, on a regular drugstore. Because we're talking about an epidemic here that can spread if we're not aware of where the problems are. So even if you're rich and if you have all the money in the world, you will get the medication from the government. Because we need to control it. So the first batch of drugs was already unpatented. By the time that it became available, the patents were free. And this foundation, the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation, is a very advanced uh, drug foundation, medicine research foundation in the country, knew how to make the drug. So they said, we're going just to fabricate it and we're going to make it available to people. The second batch of drugs was still patented, and it belonged to several different companies. I put Roche here, but there was Merck, there were so many others, because with Roche was our biggest fight, if we can call it like that. We knew that these medicines, at the cost that they were, if we had to keep paying it for all of those people, we could not afford it. And we knew at the same time that they were being sold for less in other countries. So we just came in, basic negotiation, and then we said, look, we know how to make it. We know how to make these drugs. Either you cut the prices, or we will break the patent, and we will make it at the Oswald Cruz Foundation. And then all of the corporations were like, you cannot do this. If you do this, you are um, endangering the whole research area, why would uh, a drug company want to invest money if they know that the countries are going to just break the patent and not respect it? But yeah, that's a very beautiful speech, but we know that you're selling it for much less in other countries. So what is it that we need to do? Um, and then Roche, at the time for Efavirenz, that was one of the main drugs for the cocktail, offered a discount of 7%. The fight kept coming and going and said, we are going to do it. We started importing some from India, from other drugs, until the price dropped down to 70%. They knew that we were going to do it and that we had the expertise to do it. And it, the important thing here is not to say there was a fight against drug companies. That's not it. It was just a fight for life. With that, we saved $1.1 billion dollars that would have gone straight to that and 100,000 lives. So we activated a clause of um, a trade contract saying we're trying just to control national epidemics here. Bring us to court, to World Trade Organization, do the complaint that you want, but we're just trying to, trying to control national epidemics. And more, we are trying to prevent abusive prices from being put in the whole market. What happened with this is that because they were so afraid that not only we were going to do the medicine, but teach other countries how to do it, because we said, look, we have our neighboring countries in Latin America who don't have much money either. We have historic ties with so many other countries. We're going to go there and, and take our technicians and our scientists, and we're going to teach that it caused this fear an international drop of prices. In so many other countries, these medicines were being sold by a tenth of what they originally costed. And just to conclude, whenever we're talking about a project, whenever we're talking about actions that need to be made, we need to be bold. And some people will get angry, and some people will 
not be happy with the decisions that you're making, but you have just to look at the bigger picture and make sure that you're doing that for the betterment of the whole situation of so many people that needed care. Currently in the country, um, any person has access to this treatment. Right now, the health services affirm that 100% of the diagnosed people have the treatment. The problem is that there are so many undiagnosed. They say that out of the 100% that are getting the treatment that are diagnosed only represent between 30 and 40% of the people who have the disease. So even though it's already a success, it does not stop there. And that's with every project. We should not stop once the big, beautiful results are coming up. So for now, that's what I would like to tell you. I hope that you can take something from it and adapt to your projects, your different realities, your lives, or it was just a nice, fun story, and that's already good. So thank you.